Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time. It's Saturday. I hope everybody's having a great weekend. Hope you're also, if you haven't found one, at least uh, looking and thinking about a place to go and meet with the saints on Sunday in whatever location you are, Sunday morning, afternoon, evening, whenever, some place where the Word of God is taught and it's respected and it is proclaimed as God's truth. Uh, if you ever have a problem finding that, uh, put something in the comment section or you can shoot me an email. And I'll give you that address at the end, uh, and I will see what I can do to help you find a play. I can't promise anything because the congregations are scattered out everywhere, and being autonomous in the churches of Christ, it's possible there are congregations anywhere and nobody knows about them. So uh, just let us know, and I'll do what I can. But this is day 17 of our 30 days with James and Peter, Saturday, March 9th, 2024. And uh, if you want to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll be starting there momentarily. And don't forget to hit that subscribe bar. And then the notification bell when it comes up. Uh, you'll get notified when content's added to the channel. And you know what to do about commenting, liking, and sharing the videos. Give them thumbs up if you like them. And, I pre and welcome to the new people uh, on the channel. We've had several that have uh, subscribed in the last uh, couple of weeks. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, because I can't grow the channel without the help of loyal viewers such as yourself, that's why I like you to share the videos, tell your friends about it. And so let's go to our reading now. If you've got the paper and ink uh, copy, open up your Bible there. Or if uh, you're using an app on your electronic device, then uh, open up to... Uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 13, where he says, Therefore, now remember this is therefore means he's drawing a conclusion. So when you look over at our, he uh, starts out in verse 13, therefore. Now, therefore, remember, means he's drawing a conclusion. And if you just back up a little bit to verse 11, uh, where he's begging them to be as pilgrims and sojourners uh, in, a, in a strange world and uh, have our conduct honorable among Gentiles. And so verse 13, therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all, uh, with all fear, not only uh, to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, that is, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth? Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Okay, several things here that we need to uh, take a look at. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Now, as Christians, we are free, yet we're servants. Now, how is that possible? Well, because as Christians, we can live as free people, but we have to use our freedom wisely. Now, as Christians, we are free, yet we are servants. How is that possible? Well, as Christians, we can live as free people, but we have to use our freedom wisely. We use it to glorify God. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. So there's a lot of things I can do, but is it going to be profitable for the kingdom? Is it going to be profitable for my growth? Is it going to be just profitable for anybody? Is it going to be profitable when I go out in public that I uh, am demanding of everybody around me and I go pushing people out of the way? Hey, maybe I'm standing up for myself. Maybe I'm standing up for the oppressed and all that. But 
I'm not using my freedom wisely. If I'm having a problem at the restaurant and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, I didn't order the steak. I ordered the chicken. And I can you fix it. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Versus, hey, I didn't order the steak. I ordered the chicken. Take this back and get it right. And you throw it on the floor. Not, not at all wise. Foolish. Not becoming of a Christian. Uh, there are times, sure, we need to stand our ground. We need to... I don't know about literally, but maybe figuratively overturn some tables like Jesus did in the, in the temple. But we have to remember to be wise about it. There are times that we just sometimes need to just go with the program. And then there are times we need to stand up uh, for, for what is right. Now he goes on to say in verse 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. This is basically four short sentences, or they might even be dependent clauses. The grammarians and the, group will have to figure that out but wh what's going on here well and notice yeah those are european spellings there for honor uh we honor all men we love the brotherhood okay so honor all men that means show value and respect or esteem uh, as christians we should uh, show that to everybody now it does not mean that we affirm or we uh encourage sin you know, if someone comes in, we need to explain to them, look, you're doing X, Y, or Z, that's a sin. And we can't accept you into fellowship unless you change that. That's not being cruel. That's not uh, oppressing anybody. That's just t uh, teaching what the Bible says. Now, we can still love the sinner, and we can still shake hands with them and welcome them, you know, whatever. But we do not change doctrine to uh, accommodate people's uh, beliefs. And when I'm out in public, I run into, maybe I go into a coffee shop and the person working there, they could be an atheist. They could be wearing the burqa and it's obvious they're a Muslim or they're wearing uh, some sort of other Hindu dress. I still treat them with respect. I don't get in their face and tell them they're going to hell or anything. I might get a conversation with them about, about salvation and about why I'm a Christian, why I believe that is the right way to go. But uh, I'm still going to be respectful to them. And remember, in America, we have that thing called the First Amendment. So everybody's got a right to practice whatever religion they choose as long as they're not interfering with somebody else. And then we're told in verse 17, love the brotherhood. Now, of course, we should love and respect everybody, but we should give uh, more so to the family of God, to our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like in Galatians when Paul told them to do good to all, but especially those of the household of faith. It's just everyday life. When, when I get paid, I make sure that, that our bills are covered, our groceries are paid. And then you know, what's left over, somebody needs help. Okay, I'll give somebody some money to help pay their rent or give them some groceries or whatever. But I got to take care of my family first. And then fear God, respect, reverence, and awe. Uh, th there's a lot, that all goes with fearing God. But we also, when it comes to God, need to have fear, like quaking in our boots, boots fear, because Jesus said to fear him who can cast the whole body and soul into hell. You know, don't fear man, but fear him who can do that. And remember, God is, yes, a loving, gracious God, merciful God, but he's also a God of justice. He's a God of wrath. And when it comes to God's justice, let me just tell you, you don't want it. Okay. It's not just going to be 10 days or $10 with God's justice. God's justice is going to be, in the end, it's going to be permanent. There is a place called hell, and I don't like to, you notice I don't smile when I talk about that. No, I get, that's probably about the most serious I get is when it's talking about hell and eternal destinies, because there is a place, and if you're not uh, in the right relationship with God, you're not following Christ, that's where you're, you're going to wind up. That's what the Bible says, all right? And then we need to honor the king. Now, for a number of reasons, this sticks in people's sides. But we got to remember whether or not we like the head of state uh, in America, whether or not you like the president or you like your governor or anybody in authority is really irrelevant. But if you've got to show proper respect for them, or at least for the office, if you're in the White House or if the president comes to town, you, you know, you want to have a protest, have a protest. That's fine. You don't have to be a kiss up or a suck up, nor do you have to um, uh, just uh, be a yes man to the president. You can have your differences. 
but you don't go and be disrespectful. If you, if you're saying in a private conversation with them, you don't cuss them out. Hey, you blankety blank, blank, you're doing this, that, the blankety blank. You still use proper courtesies. Uh, come on in, Mr. President. Nice to meet you, Mr. President. Do you still use proper courtesies regardless of your thoughts about the president or the governor or whoever it is in, in authority? Now comes a big one, one that causes a lot of issues with people, and that is verse 18. Servants, some translations say slaves, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Well, here's the thing. The first thing we have, and this might be a study for another time, slavery in the Bible is not the same as slavery as we know it. Exodus uh, said to uh, put to death anybody who kidnaps a man and sells him into slavery, which is chattel slavery, which is what we had uh, in America until the Civil War put a stop to it, and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, put a stop to it. Uh, that is, and that slavery was entirely race-based. Now, I've made that statement before in front of white brethren, and immediately hands go up in the class, and, oh, no, wait a minute, whites were enslaved too, and it wasn't just that, and then they go, on, okay. Sure, whites were enslaved by Barbary pirates in North Africa during the 1780s and 90s. That's what caused Thomas Jefferson uh, to build a navy. He, he uh, went to the, an ambassador, uh, I think the Turkish amb Ottoman ambassador, to the United States and asked, would you put a stop to this? Quit kidnapping our people? And, and the guy said, well, we do it because the Quran says we can do it. And, Jer and Jefferson basically said, okay, we're going to build a navy. We're coming after you. And that's exactly what happened, and it put a stop to the uh, enslavement. The word slave comes from the Slavs, who are a Central uh, European uh, people. Uh, some of my ancestors are Slavs, are from the Ukraine. So um, it's, it's different than what we have here. There's different words in the Greek and Hebrew for, uh, for slaves and servants. Sometimes they were what we would call indentured servants. That is, they put themselves into service for a period of time. And then they, um, like seven years was typical to get their passage to the United, to the New World, let's say, the United, what is now the United States. And so they would indenture themselves, enslave themselves for seven years. And then they would be free and they would be get their passage to, to the New World, to America. Now, the first century slave had an opportunity to live in a way that brought glory to God. There were apparently some who thought, okay, uh, I'm a, a, a Christian, my master is a Christian, so I should get special treatment. And they were saying, no, you shouldn't expect special treatment uh, for that. And there were good ones and, and, and good masters and bad masters. And as a servant of Christ, you know, we have indentured or put ourselves voluntarily into that service. Uh, speaking of servants, Luke might have been a servant of Theophilus. We don't really know who Theophilus is, but that's who he addresses his two writings to. He might have been Theophilus' personal physician. Don't know. And then when we go back to the uh, scriptures... The last couple of verses showing how Christ suffered for us and he left us an example to follow. Uh, if you get in trouble, you get caught d committing a crime or doing something wrong, you get fired from your job or you get put in jail for it or whatever, and you endure that patiently, you know, big deal. You got caught. You did something wrong. You got caught. But when someone, because you're a Christian, because you've been falsely accused of something uh, for being because you're a Christian and you endure that patiently, that's commendable before God. And then he talks in verse 22 how there was no deceit or guile found in Jesus' mouth. In verse 23, when he reviled, did not revile in return. He didn't threaten vengeance. He just left it up to God. And that can be a little tough to do. Uh, but we have to understand there will be eventual justice. There are crimes and bad things that have gone on in this world. And people have disappeared. Joseph Mengele comes to mind, uh, running the medi medical clinic at Auschwitz, the worst of the worst of the worst of the concentration camps. He ended up uh, escaping to South America, went for a swim in 1978 or 9, 
had, a, I think it was a stroke while he was swimming and drowned. He's buried down there in South America somewhere now. A long story made short. Well, he escaped man's justice. But I can guarantee you he's regretting everything he did to the Jews and everybody else at Auschwitz. Because when it, because he, he has to face the ultimate court and the ultimate judge, and there is no appeal. That's it. Jesus will either be your prosecutor or he will be your defense attorney. It's up to you. He's the only lawyer admitted to practice in God's divine eternal court. And right here also, uh, speaking of that, in verse 24 and 25, Peter says that by whose stripes we are healed, this is for the atonement. Jesus went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. And I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. If you are in a group that denies the atonement, oh, Jesus just went to the cross because the religious leaders needed rid of him. It was political. Rome was afraid of him. Uh, nah, it had nothing to do with the atonement. Okay, stop. Get out of there right now. Don't wa uh, walk. Uh, Run, don't walk. Get out of there. That is false teaching. That is someone that will lead you uh, to, uh, they'll lead you to hell. You need to have Jesus. He is the only way. His, the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ is what will make us right with God. So that's going to wrap it up for today. So as is our usual, we will go to God in prayer. And it's Saturday, so we will... Pray for the afflicted, our homeless, jobless, those in prison. So let's go to God in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that he brings. And today we want to lift up those who are poor, not having enough to make ends meet. Pray for the homeless. Pray for the jobless. We pray that they can uh, be able to find ways to get out of the situation they're in and become responsible and productive members of their society. And those who are in prison, Lord, we pray for them to find Jesus and to be able to get out and not recidivate, but become uh, people who can use that experience, Lord, to better their lives, help them to get back uh, or on a track that will lead them uh, down a road where they can be productive, where they can be good for the kingdom. For the sick, Lord, we pray for them. And I know several people, some are dealing with cancer and some are dealing with other diseases. want to lift them up to you and just pray your healing hand on them and give guidance and wisdom to them and to those who are treating them. And for the widows, the single mothers, we got fatherless children. Lord, help men to take their responsibilities seriously. Help all of us husbands and fathers to be the uh, spiritual leaders that we need to be in our in our homes. Give us the courage. Give us the wisdom to do it properly. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all that you provide. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. So that'll wrap it up for today. Leave your comments in the comment section below. Share these videos. If you have questions, you can send them to me to timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. If you have prayer requests, be glad to pray with you. And, uh, and uh, go to God in prayer for whatever might be on your mind. Thanks for being here. Have a great Saturday. We will see you in the next video. I am done and I am out.